Um, we now have a great uh, speaker for us today. Uh, people often ask Mr. James, who funds you? This much we know, that if Mr. James wanted to do noise studies for communities and make a lot of money, he would work on the behalf of wind developers, because that's where the money's at. Mr. James is often paid for by people who are having bake sales trying to scrape enough money together to simply pay for his gas money. I have a high degree of respect for Mr. James. His testimony has uh, been uh, useful in many court cases and so forth. I know him personally to be a man of great integrity. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Rick to you right now. Could you give me that seat? Could you give me that seat? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, feel, I feel a little bit um, pressured here because of Mr. Hartke's excellent heartfelt speech. Uh, sometimes listening to a person who's had personal experiences, particularly when they're trying to protect their family, can make sense to people when all the technical issues don't. However, I'm going to ask you to kind of sit here and, and listen to the technical issues. One of the um, mantras, if I could say it, of the wind energy uh, business is that wind turbines have posed no problems to you if they're close to homes. In, in 2008, I started to look, actually it was earlier than that, but in 2008 I started in depth to look at it, and my colleague and I at that time, George Camperman, who's one of the original founders of the Institute of Noise Control Engineering and also wrote almost all of the community noise standards in the Midwest during his career, um, both realized that because of the low frequency nature of these machines that we needed standards that were different from normal community standards. And what I'm going to try to do during this presentation is explain to you why. So if we can start here with slide one. Let's see if I'm smart enough to use this machine. Uh, some of my qualifications. And before I get into that, I, I have here the Sanilat Coalition for Wind and Jobs description. I think that was pro probably prevent, provided by Invenergy. And then it describes me as um, not being a registered professional engineer or medical professional, yet persistently trying to give opinions about engineering and medical issues without scientific basis. Well, I'll go over my credentials here in a second. But I want to point out that I'm an acoustician. Professional engineers and medical professionals cannot speak to acoustics because that's not their field. This is my field. I have a Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering from Kettering Institute in Flint, uh, the same institute that Mary Berry, now president of GM, graduated from. It's not a school for car designers, it's a school for engineers with management skills. It's very highly selective. Only one out of every hundred people that applied to it were accepted. I have 45 years of experience, much of that working for major corporations on their problems. I'm an emeritus member of the Institute of Noise Control Engineering, which is the professional organization that um, certifies um, acousticians. And my certification is as a full member. I was president from 1983 to 2006. Let's see, I got it. There we go. From 2000, uh, 1983 to 2006 of James Anderson and Associates. We had a first year partnership with General Motors and Ford. We did all of the noise work in North America. So I have a lot of experience with community noise, with large machines, large fans, and very, very noisy operations. I'm also an adjunct professor at Central Michigan University and was until 2013 an adjunct instructor at Michigan State University. This is of interest because I'm not a PhD and yet my skills and my reputation were sufficient to make both universities want to have me on their staff, primarily to work with grad students. I've published papers on topics of wind turbines since 2008 I've been qualified in hearings and legal proceedings in the US, Canada, as an expert in the measurement and the impact of wind turbine noise on people and communities in specific. And I've successfully met two Daubert challenges in the past five years supporting my expert qualifications in those areas. Daubert challenges are when people like Mr. Blazer uh, read a report or see me in litigation 
and try to make use of a Supreme Court uh, decision that, prevent, that tries to preclude junk science. Well, two judges have looked at this and concluded that what I'm saying is not junk science. It is an opinion that is well held by many acousticians, although that doesn't prevent other acousticians who choose to work for the wind industry from holding other opinions. So let's get started on some of the facts. When we talk about wind turbines, and we see them rotating gently, we don't really see what's going on to the wind or the air as it moves by them. This is an animation showing how the blades from the incoming air, which is moving from left to right, is churned by the action of the blades. All of these churnings are pressure changes. I've been in a home about 1,500 feet from a, a large wind turbine where the upper level winds were blowing that churn downwards. And you could feel the walls of the house breathing. So there's a lot of movement, a lot of energy in that churn. And it is this churn that some people feel. They feel it as pressure pulses, or they feel it as something that makes them uncomfortable. The World Health Organization in 2009 took a look at transportation, airport, and industry noise. Based upon a, a very large refunding, they re redid all of the medical research that had been done for their prior guidelines, which were 1999. And in the new guidelines, they learned that using instruments like functional MRI uh, and other instruments that weren't available earlier, that noise outside a home can affect people's sleep at night in a very negative manner. What they concluded was if the sound outside your home is 30 to 40 dBA, a few people will have problems, typically those who are chronically ill, children, or senior citizens with other types of problems. However, at 40 dBA, and this is again outside the home, they found that adverse health effects are observed above, or among the exposed population. Many people have to adapt their lives to cope with the noise at night, and vulnerable people are more severely affected. Well, what does that mean? Mr. Harkey just stood here and explained to you how he has had to change his life. He had to move. Some other people find they have to live with relatives at night. Others have resorted to sleeping in their basements. Now, it's not everybody. I think he said 21 families out of the approximately 170 homes were affected in the Vermilion County area. But that's a fairly good number, and particularly if you're one of those families. It's a very high number. But is it unusual to see that? If I go on, a, some of the symptoms here are very similar to motion sickness. If I go on a cruise liner and, I, and there's some rough weather, a lot of the people will be sitting in the ballroom or in the, in the dining room enjoying it. And a few other people will be stuck in their cabins because of nausea or other problems. So it's not unusual that we'll have a small percentage. The other thing I want to make very clear is that when the sounds are low frequency, rumble, the number of the, uh, what do I call it? the number of people that are affected is probably 20 to 30 percent, as as we might find in in um, Vermilion or even up here in Huron County. It's not going to be everybody, but the nature of that problem is that when it comes from, let's say, an industrial source or wind turbines, and experts go out to study it, many of them, because they're not in that sensitive group, don't even hear it. And so they ignore the complaints. One of the things I learned very early as a young engineer, listening to people complaining about noise from GM plants or foundries or Ford operations or other types of operations is, if a person's complaining to you, listen to them, because you may not, I may not have the ability to hear what they're hearing. I may not feel what they're feeling. And so I have to rely on my instruments in that case. And that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk. Who, uh, let's skip that part. Who also has some guidelines on low frequency noise? These are specific. This is about low frequency noise in general, and this is what you would call rumble. It's the kind of sounds that are like an engine idling outside or a big truck coming down the street with a load on it. Um, rumble, not the audible sounds. And what they've said, 1999, it should be noted that low frequency noise can disturb rest and sleep even at low sound pressure levels. 
It should be noted that a large proportion of low-frequency components in the noise increases annoyance considerably. Health effects due to low-frequency components in noise are estimated to be more severe than for community noises in general. If the noise includes a large proportion of low-frequency components, still lower guidelines DPA versus other types of thresholds should be applied. Where a noise is continuous, the equivalent sound pressure level should not exceed 30 dBA indoors. And if negative effects on sleep are to be avoided, if negative effects on sleep are to be avoided. When the noise is composed of a large proportion of low frequency sounds, a still lower guideline is recommended. Do you see the pattern here? We're saying that low frequency noise emitters have a special type of problem. And it's not for everybody, but for those who it is a problem, it is a big problem. Finally, it should be noted that a large proportion of low-frequency components in noise may increase considerably the adverse effects on health. And finally, in 1999, the evidence on low-frequency noise is sufficiently strong to warrant immediate concern. That's the World Health Organization. Studies have been done in Europe looking only at the audible sound, DBA. And those studies have found, this is a graph showing sound levels at 35, which is the recommended level that uh, Mr. Hartke was talking about, up to about 55 dBA. And we see graphs going up for industry, uh, air, airplanes, uh, traffic rail, etc. So as the higher the sound level, the more the graphs go up. And if we come over here, this is annoyance. We can see that about 40 dBA, 20, assuming the wind turbines operate all day, about 10% of the people will be highly annoyed, or annoyed. And the only, you know, that's the red line, wind turbines. The only thing that would be more annoying is a railroad shunting yard. Now, I don't know if everyone's familiar with a shunting yard, but that's where you bring in the large, long trains, you break them apart, so it's bang, clatter, with a lot of engines rumbling around. So the only thing they found that has a higher annoyance level than wind turbines was that kind of a sound outside a home. The low frequency sound from wind turbines is a product of several sources, one of which is caused by, if I can use this again, we have our picture of the wind turbine. It's rotating, the wind is coming towards the wind turbine and if you can imagine you're, you're a wind turbine blade and you've got your blades extended, the wind is pushing them back. And that's, that's where we get the energy from. Pushing them back causes the rotation which drives the generators. But as that blade comes down and reaches right in front of the tower, the wind moving towards the tower in this direction is a little bit lower. So suddenly all that energy in the blade relaxes and it snaps forward. When it snaps forward, because they're big blades, we have a pressure pulse. And so if you had a single wind turbine and it was rotating at 20 RPM, which is common for the wind turbines up by Ubley, once every second you get a pressure pulse. And our homes respond to that as though it's a pressure outside the home the infrasound comes through the walls and suddenly inside the home, we actually have more of a problem than outside because some of that energy gets trapped. When you, when you use an analyzer, and I refer to that as thump, 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 but it's actually not so much audible as something people feel, either as a pressure pulse, they may feel it in their diaphragm, in their throat, they may feel it in their ears, they may just feel dizzy. When it's analyzed, we get a graph that's very characteristic. If you know the RPM of the wind turbine, you can predict the frequency of that thump. It's called the blade passage frequency. And it'll have harmonics that are evenly staged as we go away from it. So if I look at a, a, an, an instrument test, and I can see that there is a tone with other tones that are related to that same frequency that the spin, blades are spinning at, then I can say, I know what the source is. It's the wind turbine. How long have we known about this? 
Well, some of the early experiments with wind turbines back in the 1970s led to concerns um, that wind turbine blade and tower interactions were causing a problem. Uh, in 1987, Dr. Neil Kelly, who was working for what is now known as NREL, the agency that's tasked with um, providing research and, and advice to the wind industry, um, did a study in which they found that wind the pulses produced by wind turbines are perceptible to people at sound pressure levels far below what is needed for them to be audible. Now, one of the, the experts that has been advising the wind industry since the early 2000s is Dr. Jeff Leventhal, a British acoustician. His statement has been that, well, until the levels are high enough to be heard, you can't have any problems. Well, he's wrong. Actually, he made that statement in 1978. He said, if you can't hear it, you can't feel it. Well, four years later, Dr. Neil Kelly, excuse me, Four years later, Dr. Neil Kelly started work that proved him wrong. But you'll still hear the acousticians working for the wind industry claiming, if you can't hear it, you can't feel it. And the truth of the matter is, if the sound comes as pressure pulses, you can hear it long or you can feel it long before you hear it. 2009, I did a study up here in Ubley with, with Wade Bray. Now, uh, Wade is an acoustician who works with the auto industry to eliminate rumble from the interior of the high-end cars. Why does the auto industry pay to have people who eliminate rumble from the high-end cars? It's because it's been linked with motion sickness. So, if you, and in fact, his company got started working for one of the uh, German auto companies who had a particular problem in a very expensive car and everyone thought it was related to the motion of the car. And he, fo he found that it was due to the sounds in the back seat being slightly out of, out of sync with each other, causing people to get sick to their stomach. They changed the exhaust system, and lo and behold, the problems went away. So one of the experts who works with designing aircraft cabins, auto cabins, et cetera, to prevent these kind of problems, we went to Ubley, we took a test outside the home of the Poplinski family. And we, we did that using the same kind of instruments you'd use to analyze an auto, automobile. And what we found was there were pressure pulses and that those pressure pulses were distinct and palpable to the people inside the home. Again, 2012, um, in Shirley Wind uh, Project in Brown County, Wisconsin, uh, four acousticians, two representing the wind industry and two representing independents, uh, did a study at, a, at several farm homes using the same procedures we did back in 2009, and they found the same thing. And they concluded that infrasound from the blade pass frequency and was associated with the complaints of adverse sensations and experiences for the people in that county. In 2014, the Brown County Board of Health declared the Shirley Wind utility to be a human health hazard. The, the, met, the Board of Health concluded that the region of, of concern was out to two and a half miles. So two and a half miles with some complaints extending to four miles. And that's because the infrasound travels with very little loss, where, where high frequency sounds attenuate such that you might not hear them a quarter mile away or a half mile away. Low frequency sound travels distances. And you, you know that when you listen to thunder in the distance. Long before you can hear the sound of the crackle of lightning, the high frequency sound, you can hear the thump and the rumble from an uh, approaching storm. Low frequency sound just travels much farther. And, and that same rumble might cause you to have a little uh, body resonance. So just let me make a hypothetical. If a storm's on the horizon and you feel it make your stomach uh, quiver, that's not much of a problem, it's an early warning sign. But if that happened to you on an ongoing basis, seven days a week, every night, then it's a big problem. So this isn't about, this isn't about big issues. It's about little issues all the time. This is, uh, was a, a presentation put together by Dr. Malcolm Swinbanks uh, about Huron County. Now Malcolm Swinbanks is a resident of Huron County um, half of the year. The other half of the year he runs his acoustics lab in Britain, uh, in Cambridge. 
He's a mathematical acoustician who works for the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense on preventing low frequency and infrasound from affecting our soldiers. So he knows what he's talking about too. And what he said, in, what he pointed out in this paper is when you get to the point where there are so many wind turbines around, oops, around homes that there is no place that a person can go in a county. And he can feel those, he lives over here on the uh, east side, three, three kilometers, roughly two miles away from the nearest wind turbine. On days when the wind is blowing from west to east, he can feel it in his basement. He's personally sensitive to it. Uh, he's also the, the scientist or the acoustician who holds the patents on the silencers used by the airplane industry for eliminating the roar of large jet engines. Those of you who are old enough to remember the jets from the 1960s, they made so much noise coming in and, and taking off that in many cases communities were thinking of banning them. So there was a lot of work done by people like Malcolm to find ways to silence them, and they've been effective. Airplanes today are much, much quieter than they were back then. So maybe with the proper application of science, the wind industry can find a way to reduce these problems, but they haven't on the current generation. In Brown County, Wisconsin, after the Department of Public Health uh, declared the Shirley Wind Project a human health hazard, signs like these started appearing. And I'll tell you, if, if having wind turbines uh, affects your property values, uh, posting a sign like this on your property yard definitely affects your property values. What would be a good limit? Well, back in 2008, uh, Mr. Kaplan and I sat down and just using the standard acoustical procedures that would be used for estimating whether a new manufacturing plant would have an impact. We found that in order to have wind turbines meet those kind of criteria, they needed to be 6,600 feet away from the nearest home. And under the, my interpretation, at least of US law, we all buy property with the expectation we get to use it for our own enjoyment. Some people buy extra acres just to have that privacy. And that's where um, Mr. Martis's concept of uh, trespass zoning comes in. If the noise is only measured to your home, then you've really given access to all of your property to someone who's not compensating you for it. What, it, what kind of limit would be the bat, would be required? Well, the, the proper limit is to test the sound levels at night and then add five decibels and set that for a limit. Well, in normal quiet communities like, like yours, um, nighttime sound levels are roughly 25 to 30 dBA. That's why you can open the windows at night and not have anything disturb you. You don't have heavy traffic going by. It's quiet. In fact, usually the loudest thing are you know, the insects at night and the birds in the morning. But for an industrial source, the criteria should be not to exceed the existing sound levels at night. And again, excluding those insects and things that are not, that are not there all year, uh, plus five. And that gives you 35 dBA. Not the 55 dBA or the 50 dBA or even the 45 dBA we see in a lot of standards that the wind industry supports, but 35 dBA. For the lowest frequency sound, the low frequency sounds, it should be no more than 50 dBC. DBC, uh, DBA is a reading that ignores all of the low frequency sound. It just focuses on those frequencies that are more audible. DBC includes the low frequency sound. So you can easily have a situation where 35 dBA is the same as 50 dBC. Now, down below I've been tracking here on County's uh, most recent revision. They're set back 1,640 feet to the nearest home, 750 feet to the nearest property line. They have no uh, concern over how much the noise is raised from pre-existing conditions. And 45 LEQ as the limit. Well, the difference between 35 dBA, that's a not to exceed. Because we know at night the thing that wakes up the, the most is when you hear some sound that is fluctuating, a dripping water faucet, for example. If, the, if one of the fixes for dripping water faucets that I've used 
is to turn the water on enough that it's not dripping anymore and just let it run a little bit because it's the dripping that wakes me up, not the sound of the water. So, let's see. Um, 45 LEQ is an average. It means half the time the sound level can be more than 45. My 35 dBA means it doesn't go over 35, and that's the difference between the two. There's, there's no consideration for low frequency noise in here on County. For impulsive noise, thump, 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 you add a, we would add a minus 5 dB penalty. This is common in, in even community noise standards. And for tones, we'd add another 5 dB penalty. And the Huron County standard has no, no limits for low frequency or impulsive, but they do have a minus 5 dB for tones. However, it's a very strict standard, uh, very much out of date, uh, the, the way you calculate the penalty. Um, as far as infrasound, which is the sounds we can't hear but we can feel, those the, if you can't hear it, you can't feel it group who do feel it, um, the way we have uh, looked at the data is that if you have those tones and you sum up the energy in them and they, all, and they add up to more than 50 dB, that seems to be the point where people start saying, I've got to move. If they're sensitive. If they're not sensitive, your neighbor may be saying, I don't know what's wrong with you, you're crazy. But then again, if we go back to the ship in, in, on a bad sea, some of the people are having fun and the other people are hiding in their cabins. So we're looking here to protect the people who are more sensitive, the more vulnerable people. What to look for, tones at blade pass frequency with harmonics, as I showed earlier. And the blade pass frequency can be used to estimate the RPM of the hub, hubs. And if there are no wind turbines, we don't find any tones. There's been talk about, well, infras uh, the infrasound from wind turbines is masked by the normal infrasound. I'll show you a slide a little bit later that shows that's anything but true. Normal infrasound does not have tones or pulses. It is entirely different. And the natural background infrasound, storms, dusting winds, a storm front passing, um, those are things that don't happen every night. They're not 24-7, 365 days a year. But if you've ever been awakened at night by your house having wind hitting it, if that happened every night, you wouldn't like it. So again, this is about things happening all the time that might not bother you if it only happened once in a while. Uh, this gets into the instrument tests. Uh, I'll, well, I'll go back here. Th th these are really sophisticated test instruments, but the most sensitive instrument for complex sounds are people. People are much better than any of the instruments we have. So when a person says to me, I can feel it as a pressure in my ear, or I can feel it in my throat, or when the turbines are running, I feel a little wobbly, or I, my eyes don't line up. Those are indications to me that they're sensing something that maybe my instruments can't, not that they're lying to me. I take people on face value until I find out otherwise. The instruments are shown here, a microbarometer, it just looks like a small uh, metal box. Whereas a sound level meter with a microphone, an infrasonic microphone uh, over here would look more like a tripod with a big foam ball on the top. Now here's one of my graphs, and I, I ask you to bear with me. Here we have infrasound inside my office at home. I have no wind turbines near me. And if you notice along the bottom, whoops, that the only line, th this, this uh, graph shows tones as colored lines going left and right, or from left to right. There is one tone there, and that is because I left an oscillating fan that moved back and forth that was basically putting air over the microphone. So just the, one of those typical vertical fans that oscillate, we pick, I can pick that up on this graph is this green line, we see it here as a few little upper spikes in the graph. Now when I take a graph, or I do the same kind of test near wind turbines, and this was one of the Shirley Wind cases, what we see are tones. Here's the blade pass tone. Here's the harmonics. We see up here the spikes that are represented by below. And over here on the left side, the wind turbines are off when we start. 
And you'll see these lines kind of gradually move up a little bit, indicating the RPM of the weight blade starts out slow and then it increases. So we have this little up ramp. We come over here about halfway through the night. And then that, that thin line begins to break apart into several lines, indicating some of the wind turbines are turning at different speeds. They then come back together just uh, late morning. And by about, I think, 10 o'clock in the morning, they shut off. And so here's what infrasound looks like in the farm home when there are no wind turbines. And here's what it looks like when there are. There's a clear distinction. And that distinction is something people can feel if they happen to be part of that sensitive group. Here's another look at it, this time with, with infrasonic microphones. It's a little more complex, but what we're looking at here, instead of the green line that we looked at before, now we're looking at these red lines, but they represent the same energy in narrow frequency bands going all the way up, and we can see it on the graph up here as these tones that are standing up the blue spikes. Here's the end of the sample. I zoomed in on it. And this is what it looks like in the home when there are no wind turbines operating versus this with the tones when they are. So I then we've done a similar type testing over here in um, um, is it Oliver and Chandler Township with the, with the help here of uh, Bob McLean. Um, we put a microbarometer in three homes, and we left it there for about a week at each, each place. Uh, one home, the two homes that we're going to look at are over here, uh, right on the edge of Chandler Township. That's Mrs. Berry's home there. Okay, Mrs. Berry's. And up on the top, um, I think it's Rusty Crone's home. And for uh, the Berry home, this is a zoom up on it. We can see we have wind turbines in all directions, roughly between, uh, let's say, 1,300 feet and 2,500 feet, many of them being in a, in a direction where they're picking up that downwind churn from, that we saw in that earlier slide. The test for that home is shown here. Um, and we can see the tone band. I've circled it in black to make them a little bit more visible. But we can see the tones here in the uh, spectrogram. And we can see them up here again in the, I took just this little piece of it and zoomed in on it. We can see the tones at that point. Um, going back to the other site up here on the north end, um, again, uh, here's a, uh, I, I didn't do the, the black circles, but I tried to draw lines. Here's the fundamentals and the harmonics being shown along the right. And we see those horizontal lines. It was a very windy period. There was a lot of churn in the air, so we pick up a lot of um, wind effect on the homes and, and effect on the homes from the buffeting from the turbine turbulence. But we can see during a period where the turbines whoops, were just operating by themselves without a lot of low level wind, here we see again those tones being very clearly defined. And in order to give you an appreciation for what it looks in a dynamic mode, um, I have a, a little video here this is right off of the screen of my analysis equipment that um, shows the moving tones. Let me get this up here. We're looking, come on. Looking up here, the, the blade pass frequency is a, right in this region. And you'll, if you watch these tones moving up and down, these are the pulses that are coming into the home. And you can see it's fairly dynamic. At, at some of the frequencies, we're already beginning to see that we have these tones that just stand out. Um, this is about a minute long. I, I'm not going to show the whole thing. But we can leave it on here and just let it draw while I open the floor for questions. We're going to take three questions. Ask the person to ask us one question in the Yes, sir. Um, I've offered, but there's very little interest on their part. 
Um, the the uh, acousticians who work for them know very well how to take and duplicate my tests. And as I said in Shirley Wind, uh, Dr. Paul Schlomer, who is the director of the Acoustical Society of America's technical committee, uh, and two acousticians who work with the wind industry and one who does not, all use the same instruments or the same methodologies and found the same thing. So that's one of the areas where we get a pressure pulse as the, press, as the blades are being pushed back. And then it comes in front of that tower. The wind will slow down just a little bit as it comes to the tower due to, um, well, it's the way air acts when it meets an obstacle. And that's enough to allow the, pre the tension in the blade to relax, causing it to snap forward, and we get a pressure pulse from that. Yes? It's very similar to when you're on a plane ride and you go through a downdraft and suddenly the plane falls. Uh, we've seen it on TV, I don't know if any of you have experienced, but when the, the wind that's moving over a, a blade changes characteristics, the lift on the blade changes. And if it changes, then you're going to lose lift. On an airplane, it means the plane comes down. And on a wind turbine, it means the blade snaps forward. But in both cases, the same type of effect. We're, the aerodynamic forces on the blade are changing, and the resulting um, loss of lift causes the wing to no longer uh, be in the right position. Go ahead, Mr. Blazer. I spent a little time on it, yes. Well, I'm, I'm, that, that, that's an excellent point. The director of the Brown County Board of Health changed since 2014. Not Board of Health, um, Department of Public Health. And um, she was asked if there was sufficient evidence to support a lawsuit against Duke Energy. She concluded there wasn't. However, that does not overturn the Board of Health's decision. I, I see you shaking your head. I have this from the Board of Health. I checked on it. Um, and you're, you can shake your head all you want, Mr. Blazer. But, but no, you can't. No, you can't. You asked a question. You're not here as an attorney cross-examining me. I'm telling, them what, I'm telling them what they said. Well, you can tell them on your meeting. Go ahead and tell them on your meeting, sir. Why aren't you telling these people the truth? Folks, look, folks, you've seen from Invenergy what their definition of good neighbor actually means. You citizens have brought into this community uh, experts to represent your case. You see what it would be like trying to enforce your wind ordinance against a firm like Invenergy, a firm that hosts multiple $10,000 plate fundraiser dinners for President Obama. That's the kind of money that they have to pour into these things. Why do they fly or transport Mr. Blazer here? Why do these people continue? Why do they spend $160,000 on the campaign in Moore Township? Because they want the right to trespass upon your private property for free, and if the zoning doesn't grant that to them, they take their toys and go home. 
You will never be able to enforce your noise ordinance once it's adopted because you will never be able to afford to pay for enough attorneys in a township of a thousand people to compete with Invenergy. You don't have deep enough pockets. Once they are in, you have lost forever your right to enforce your own ordinance because you'll go broke trying to do it. That's why Mr. Blazer is here. He wants to disrupt, he wants to discredit, at the same time he wants to claim he's a good neighbor. Those two things are incongruous. We're going to take two more questions from Mr. James and then I'll speak. Next question. Yes, sir. I, I, that were in, in Brown County, um, the Board of Health has reviewed the uh, something like 21 homes within the eight wind turbine project. They now have 80, 80 certified affidavits from people who have problems. My question is, um, those 80 real. Well, that's what, that's what um, I don't know if you were here for the October meeting, but Mr. Crone um, is a leaseholder, and that's what he's learned. The, 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 the issues may not be even with the family who's making the decision. It could be the mother-in-law moves in later, or someone decides to get married and we have kids. So the decision you're making when you, when you sign a lease or when you invite in a, a wind project is something that lasts forever, or at least forever in terms of my life, and you don't know what's going to happen. But yes, there are people who initially don't have an effect and later on do, that may be due to you know, changes in their own physiology or it may be due to acclim um, Well, Dr. Salt says there, there's a, a process in the, where the um, brain begins to um, initially ignores these s signals, but then later on begins to accept them. Um, that's not my field. My field is based entirely on listening to people and trying to figure out what is the basis for the complaints. I have studied Mr. Hartke's home. The same problems that we see in the homes that I've shown you are in his home. Uh, the same levels and the same types of tones. Uh, at this point, we have very little research other than, very little pure research other than that by Dr. Uh, Kelly back in the 1980s and other people who were working for NASA and the Department of Energy at that time. But they've proved and they established very clearly that when a person's exposed to pressure pulsations, you have sensations that are not present if the sounds did not have those pulsations. So if it was a tone that rose, a nice sine wave tone, uh, people don't have a problem with that. But when it's a pulse, quiet, pulse, quiet, pulse, quiet, and the two have the same energy, the, the nice smooth tone versus the choppy one, uh, people will perceive that choppy one. And I think, I mean, again, using a, a, a ship metaphor, if you're out on rolling waves, it's a lot different experience than if you're on choppy waves. Um, it, it's just, there's more jerk to the body. And it's that jerk, it's that pressure pulse that's being picked up either as pressure in the ears uh, or vestibular disturbance. But for that, I mean, uh, I think um, Mr. Hartke referenced Dr. Nina Pierpont's book, Wind Turbine Syndrome. Um, as Mr. Blazer would like to say, she's not, not a scientist, but she is a doctor. And as a doctor who looked at children who were coming to her clinic in New York for behavioral problems, she found more behavioral problems from children who were, were living in a new wind farm and began to investigate it and concluded that these problems were related to the type of situation, or the type of sound that I'm talked about here in persona. And there's now case definitions for it. The other thing is the wind industry likes to say there's no medical support. Well, there's a group of codes, uh, international codes that are used for billing and for documenting medical problems. I, I don't remember the name, I think it's ICD or something like that. And there is a specific code for vestibular problems related to infrasound. So the idea that there's no medical support for what I'm saying is ridiculous. If you go to your doctor, there's actually a circle they can put on the insurance form to get your, your um, uh, case covered. So this is, this is about a particular type of machine with a particular characteristic that's different than we've ever seen before in rural communities 
It's not a tractor idling in a field. It's not someone out collecting beets or potatoes. It's not someone doing haying. It's a machine that is truly a utility scale machine with a unique characteristic, both in terms of its low frequency and its audible sounds, that information as far back as the 1980s said, don't belong to your people's homes. 